In this video, I'm going to show you the most common science technician interview questions and help you plan really strong answers to these that will help you get the job. So let's look at a really important question around safety. That is, what would you do if a teacher or a technician isn't following safety procedures and they want someone who's going to be strong on this and can actually ensure that people are behaving in a safe way? So the first thing you do is you be very strong and be very clear and say safety procedures must always be followed. There's no negotiation in that. You're going to ensure that safety procedures are followed. The next thing you say is that in your department, there'll be robust health and safety training and an induction program for any new staff to ensure that everyone knows exactly what the safety procedures are. You would then intervene to ensure safety when appropriate. So if you saw something that was unsafe, you couldn't just allow that to happen without it being challenged and corrected. You are partly responsible for health and safety, along with everybody else involved in running practical science, and you take that responsibility very seriously. Then you'll say that you would report the incident in line with the school's policy. There's been a health and safety breach. That can't be left alone. It has to be reported and appropriate actions have to be taken. And you're going to work with the school constructively to ensure that that takes place. The next thing that we need to look at is how would you improve practical science at this school? And you can take lots of the points that I make here and include them in other answers that you could be having to give at your interview. So let's plan a good answer to how you could improve science at this school and you'll have lots of good material ready for your interview. So the first thing is you think about getting the basics right. Then you think about knowledge and training that is essential in good practical science. And then you think about the curriculum and how you can have an impact on that. So the basics is you have to ensure that practical is purposeful, that students aren't just doing practical because it's fun, it's enjoyable. They're not just mixing chemicals together for no reason and doing it a bit like a cookery class. There is an actual point to the practical and that they help the students actually learn and understand the science. They are there to aid the curriculum. The next thing you want to be clear about is that you will ensure that there's clear and effective procedures that are in place for health and safety, staff induction, ordering and prep room maintenance, so that all the things in the background just run wonderfully and smoothly that you would look to support in lessons when you've got capacity. So when everything's prepared and you've got some time, you ought to be able to go into lessons, support teachers and support students in really understanding those practicals. And fundamentally, you need smooth running and a reliable technical function. So whatever teachers are ordering and requesting, that happens and it's to a good standard, it's prepared correctly. And so that teachers are not having to worry about that so much, they can focus on the teaching that all of this in the background is gonna run really smoothly. Then think about knowledge and training. So you want to serve as a knowledge base for practical science. You are an expert in practical science and your expertise is gonna to add to the knowledge base of the school and teachers are gonna to come to you for advice because you are that bank of knowledge. Then you say that you would proactively support teachers to build their knowledge of practical science. You want to be actively involved in having conversations with teachers, suggesting new ways of doing it, feedback, all those sort of things you're going to be involved in. You want to put in place rigorous support for new science teachers, so people who are inexperienced. You're going to be there helping them to plan their practicals, understand what they could do, showing them lots of different ways to demonstrate things with the equipment that you have, and being very proactive in that case. You want to support with departmental CPD where appropriate. And then curriculum, you want to support the head of department in planning practical and curriculum. You want to be someone that they can go to for advice. You want to ensure resourcing matches the curriculum. So you want to look at what things you have available in the prep room, what equipment you have, what the curriculum requires, and make sure that all of that matches up perfectly. And then you want to work to help ensure that the practical is linked to the learning intentions and it actually moves the learning forward. So if a demonstration, for example, is not a good demonstration and doesn't show something very well, you might think, actually, could we do that a bit differently? This is a better demonstration or students are really struggling with this idea. How could we make it clearer to them and really being part of the curriculum development as a technician? So if you structure your answer around these key things. You could talk about having a real impact, be confident that you can have that impact and really be passionate about the impact that you can have because a really good science technician makes an enormous difference to a school and can really drive forward learning and is a real, really great asset for the school. And if you can demonstrate that, they're really gonna to want to hire you. 
And then a top read is this the Gatsby Foundation. They've got their good practical science report. It's a good idea to have a read through that. Use some of the things that they talk about and also mention that you read that in your interview, that this is one of your resources that you go to for understanding what good practical science looks like. And now we have a really strong answer and lots of things that you could talk about doing and that we, what you can offer the school to make a really strong case for them hiring you. Another thing that commonly affects technicians is what would you do if two teachers request the same equipment at the same time? Happens all the time. How do you deal with that? And there's certain things you can mention in your answer and then you want solutions. If you are presented in your interview with a problem, always talk about solutions. Don't talk about why this is a big problem and there's nothing you can do and it happens all the time and it's really annoying. Talk about how you can fix it or how you can reduce it. So you want to mention things that you anticipate, issues way ahead that you ensure that orders from teachers come in well in advance so you can see a week before where there is a clash and so you've got time to put something in place. You plan ahead so you know what's happening next week so you know when those clashes are potentially going to take place and that you communicate that if there's an issue, you talk to people, you share the um, issues that you have and you work with people in your team to help resolve them. So solutions that you can suggest is that where the equipment is in demand, one teacher might be able to use it for the first half, one teacher may be able to use it for the second half. If it's demonstration, they might only need it for five minutes and it can be moved between classes. Consider alternatives. Is there two ways to do the same practical with different equipment? And one teacher can use method one, one teacher can use method two, and you explain both methods. That's another way to get around it. Professional negotiation where you have a fair and open conversation and try to resolve it between the members of staff and yourself, or you can have a standing policy in the department where new teachers and trainees get priority because an experienced teacher can change the order of things or change around their lessons much easier than a new teacher who's already planned something and then suddenly has this change. They can't adapt as quickly. So that may be a fair solution that your department comes up with to ensure that your newest teachers are best supported. So that's how you could answer a question around these sort of ideas. The next one is a kind of practical task. Uh, they could ask about how to do it, or a lot of schools actually will ask you to do a practical task to prepare a practical or quite often, they might ask you to make up a solution. So you're going to use the best laboratory techniques you can. You're going to try and work very safely. And you're going to ensure that you actually achieve what they've asked for. So if they ask about how you make a solution, which is the most common question, the answer you would use is you would always follow an approved method. So you don't just make it up, even if you've been doing this for a long time, that you always use a recipe card. You follow that, for example, from Cleaps. And that is how you make it up. You're following a clear approved method that when you're doing any sort of practical science, you're going to wear a lab coat, appropriate PPE in line with the recommendations of the approved method. You're going to follow all safety procedures. For example, you may need to do it in a fume cupboard and that you wouldn't be preparing solutions in a lone working environment because that's not entirely safe. You ought to select an appropriate stock solution. This is the easiest way to make it. You would have a more concentrated solution and you'd be diluting it down. A great thing to mention if they talk about making acidic solutions is that you ensure you add the acid to the water and never the water to the acid. It's a highly exothermic reaction, so it releases a lot of heat. So if you have concentrated acid and you pour large amounts of water into it, it's going to be a problem. So you always have to do it the other way around and do it very, very slowly and carefully. You could then calculate how much stock solution and deionized water is needed. Don't use normal water. Ask for deionized water. If they say there's none, then you're going to have to use water, but point out that you would in future or you would prefer to use deionized water. And then if you want to do the calculations, you could use a serial dilution calculator would be the easiest way to do it because it'll do all the calculations for you and make sure it's from a reliable source. And then you would very slowly add the deionized water. So you know how much acid you need. You know how much... Um, deionized water you need and you just top it up to the volume that you need and that's how you make up the solution it's a good idea if you're not confident on this to watch a video of someone preparing some of these solutions because you could be asked to make them up and if you can't do it you're going to be marked really badly because they want to hire people that can do fairly straightforward things like this so learn that method watch a video of someone doing it if you're not confident and you'll be ready for this in your interview Another question can be something around new or trainee science teachers or how would you support them? Some things you could talk about is getting the basics right, 
what actual physical support you could offer, and then how you're going to develop them and help them to improve. So the basics is they need induction, and they need a basic sort of training before they can do any practical. You have to ensure that they know how all of the equipment works. They have to know how the labs work. They have to know the safety procedures. They have to know, for example, what happens if a student gets something in their eye. And you need to have a clear process in your department for ensuring that new science teachers and trainee teachers get an induction. Then the support, you could demonstrate the practicals. So before they actually do it, they could come and see you and you could show them how it's done, show them how the equipment works. You want to anticipate issues. So there may be particular practicals or particular equipment that you know from experience that new technicians um, and new teachers struggle with and you're going to put that support in. You're going to highlight key information. So you might look at a practical and go for this one. It's really, really important that they definitely know not to do this or that they have to do this. For example, it might be a chemical that should not go down the sink and you need to make that very, very clear to them. This chemical does not go down the sink. It needs to go in this container. So things like that, you're going to anticipate because you know that they're newer. You know that they're more likely to make mistakes. So you're going to be very proactive. If you've got capacity and you can, you're going to prioritize them for support. So if they're doing a challenging practical, you might ask if you can be in the lesson with them and support them in delivering that to ensure that it's done right and ensure that they feel well supported. And then things you can do to develop is those continuous mentoring conversations that you have. After a practical, you say, how did it go? What did this do? What did that do? How could you have done that differently? Or um, just mentioning, I see you're coming up to teach this topic on waves. Here's some things that I would suggest you might want to look at. Supporting with CPD in, in faculty, helping with training those teachers, and maybe lesson drop-in. So you're going to be walking around the department, popping into lessons, just having a look, seeing the practical science, providing some um, advice and tips after the lesson, and ensuring that it's being done well across the department. So they are really great things that you could talk about to show that you're proactive and you're actually going to have an impact. Because if a technician did all of these things, then you would be having a really big impact on the quality of teaching and the quality of practical science. And you would look like a really great technician and that would help you get the job. Another sort of thing that you need to be aware of for your interview is questions around safety that are traps, which is, would you do this thing that is dangerous? Or a teacher wants to do this dangerous thing, are you going to let them? And the answer always has to be no. So here's a question. What would you do if a student came to the prep room requesting some chemicals? The answer is no. You're not going to hand over chemicals to a student and let them walk away with them unsupervised. That would be very unsafe. So sometimes in the interview, you get asked trap questions where there's a clear wrong answer. In that case, you would perhaps ask the student uh, which teacher sent you, and then you would go with the chemicals in your hand and deliver them to the teacher in person in the correct room. You'd never hand over chemicals to a student to take away unsupervised. That would be ridiculous because you don't know what's going to happen to those. The student could just put them in their bag and take them home. That would be extremely dangerous. You need to ensure that those are delivered to the teacher and that that is just part of basic safety. Another more serious emergency that could take place is what would you do if you noticed the scalpel was missing after a practical? So they could give you a scenario where something's went badly wrong and you need to deal with it and deal with it with appropriate urgency. So the first thing you ought to be clear about is this should never happen. This is not something that could ever happen when I'm a technician, that it would never be a situation where we'd get to the end of the lesson, the scalpel would be gone and we'd have no idea where it was and all the students have left. That would not happen that scalpels are always counted in and counted out. Scalpels sometimes are signed for, that you hand the teacher 20 of them and they sign a document that says, I received 20 of them. And then when they're counted back in, they sign it to say that there's 20 of them. And then you sign it to say that there's 20 of them. That sort of thing should happen. That there's clear procedures and policies for management of sharps. So in the department, you have a sharps policy and that is always followed. That if it was a case where you had 20 scalpels went out and at the end of the lesson there's 19, no students leave the room. Everyone who's in that room must stay in that room until it is located. It is an emergency and you would immediately alert the senior leadership team via the radio if the school has it, via the, the telephone, and you would ensure that the senior leadership were aware of this issue immediately and the action could be taken. It may have to be that students have to be searched very serious things would have to happen in this case. And it is absolutely imperative that that scalpel is found and you would support in ensuring that because it's a big safety breach 
if not. So it's something you've got to take super seriously and be very strong in your interview that you would do the right thing in this situation. Mention all these things on the list and you're going to have a strong answer to this. Another thing you have to be aware of is you get safeguarding questions. So I would expect at least one question that touches on safeguarding. I couldn't tell you what the question will be, but I can tell you the general sort of things that every safeguarding question should include. So you should immediately say that safeguarding is a responsibility that you take extremely seriously. It's not someone else's job. Safeguarding is everyone's job and you take it extremely seriously and you ensure that you do it properly. That it takes priority over everything. Commonly in interviews, they'll say there's the phone is ringing. You need to hand some paperwork to a teacher. A practical needs to go out and there's a serious safeguarding issue. Which one of these are you going to do first? You're not going to answer the phone. You're not going to worry about the teacher's printing. The practical can wait. Let's deal with the safeguarding issue. So that takes priority over everything. So any prioritizing, the safeguarding issue goes above everything else. You need to know the school safeguarding lead. So who is the teacher that is in charge of that, that you can report concerns to and that you work with and that you know the safeguarding policy. So you'd say that immediately before starting, I would read the school's safeguarding policy and all of the legislation and laws and ensure that I follow that. That safeguarding is treated with appropriate confidentiality. So if a student was to disclose something to you, you don't go and tell everybody about it randomly you only pass that information on to the appropriate people in line with the safeguarding policy. You can't promise to a student you'll keep a safeguarding issue um, secret. That would be totally inappropriate. That needs to be passed on to the appropriate people to ensure that that student is kept safe. You make it clear that um, safeguarding is a shared responsibility and technicians are part of the safeguarding. And then you say, I will at all times follow the school's safeguarding policy. So whatever you do, you are going to ensure that you follow the school's policies. Keep going back to the school's policy. If the school has a website, it's a good idea to read their safeguarding policy and then discuss it at your interview. So I hope your interview for science technician role goes well. And I hope this video was really helpful. If it was, please like and subscribe. Best of luck in your interview. And finally, thank you very much for watching.